are going to be attacking the sort of the tablets, bring your own device and makers and gaming. And uh, it may seem like we're sort of diverse in what we're doing, but you'll see in our conversation that we're really in the same space. The way we'll make this quick, I'm John Idelson. I was at this morning. I'm still at this afternoon. If you want more details, you can look in the program. Go for it. Uh, my name is Nithin Jilla, and I'm the uh, co-project manager of AppGem Plus. Uh, to tell you a little bit about the uh, program, uh, it started three years ago, and we focus on kind of three different key stakeholders. One is college students, uh, the second is middle school kids, and the third is elementary school kids. And what we do is we essentially train college students every summer on this whole process of how to be a mentor and how to create an Android mobile app, uh, which then they go out into after school sites and work with after school programs every fall for 10 weeks uh, and help these guide middle school students in forming teams and creating you know, their own fully blown out Android app in just 10 weeks. Um, and those apps are then used by elementary school kids in K through five. So it's this whole continuum of learning that we're trying to build, um, and that's AppJam Plus. A, a, a big maker part, yeah. part, and what are you up to? Uh, my name is Jens Peter De Pedro. I come from Toka Boca. We make uh, apps for children uh, age three to nine, so if you have kids in that age range, you might know of us. We are the second highest ranked kids app maker on the App Store, uh, only after Disney. Uh, 85 million downloads, 27 apps. Um, our apps are digital toys, we call them. So we don't consider ourselves uh, an educational company, but there's definitely learning in there. Uh, creativity, social skills, motor skills. Um, and yeah, that's, that's us. I'm a play designer at the company, so I come up with, uh, with concepts for games. Play designer, I like the fact that you say that you're from Tokoboko rather than Sweden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Toko Boca is from Sweden, so am I. Okay. <laughs> Half Spanish also. John. Hi, I'm John Galvin. I manage the education vertical at Intel. And three years ago, we formed a new team. We're the only fully integrated vertical team at Intel, where we focus on solutions that will really advance the one-to-one -one learning model. So we design hardware specifically for use within the classroom. We have an integrated software stack so that the devices can be used throughout the day. It has applications for science, art, reading, and we acquired a company last year that gave us a digital learning platform where we can actually work with publishers to deliver the digital curriculum and then also it has an analytics engine behind it so that we can move into an adaptive learning model. And then we train teachers. We prepare them for the technology coming into their classrooms, help them build out new lesson plans, and really it becomes a lifelong engagement with the teachers of how we advance technology and learning. So in terms of lifelong engagement, how do your apps affect lifelong engagement with learners? Well, they do because they, children are very motivated to use them. They love them. And, uh, and that, can, that is really what usually motivates someone to want to learn technology, is that you see a technology and you wonder how it's made. Could I make something similar? I have an idea that I'd like to and see in real life. We often get, um, all our games are called something with Toka, and, and often our fans write in and come up with new ideas. We, we have Toka Hair Salon, Toka Kitchen. They say, I'd like to see a Toka school, and, and they start drawing it and send us drawings. So we're, I think we're inspiring uh, people to create digital things. And you have students who are creating digital things. How does that work? Exactly. And you know, the, the beauty of it is when you have a group of middle school students and you know, who are from low-income, underserved communities who don't really have access to technology, and you put them in a room and you say, pull out your phone, look at the most popular game you play, whether it's Angry Birds or something else, and now think about how could you make that game? It's really empowering for them, you know, and they think that's not possible. And then after 10 weeks, you know, here's a group of three to four students, bright minds, very young, who, you know, who are saying, this is my app, and they're ready to get up there and present and compete, you know, with everyone. So, it's so you just fun. graduated how recently? I graduated from college in 2013 as a computer science major. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, I, I think I was 18, 13. So, <laughs> <laughs> so when you're, getting students to create games, a lot of the models, the games that are created probably come from the ideas of the games that you play because you're the most popular in the world. You're an international type organization. Yeah. How does a group like Intel deal with these little companies and connecting to school, you're connecting with schools, you're connecting at home? Sure, well, education's local. So even though we work with big global companies, uh, HP, Lenovo, we also work with big multinational software companies. 
but really to deliver a meaningful solution, we have to work with someone who's developing it locally based on what the teachers need, what the students are interested in, working sometimes with the local publishers on it. So around the world, we really cultivate those relationships. And to, prov to provide a complete solution is partnerships. So we know that we can't do it on our own. We have to partner with the hardware manufacturers. We have to partner with the software manufacturers. Sometimes it really is hearing from teachers a need that they have and then trying to track down someone who's going to be able to fulfill that need for them. The quick question. How many in the audience are from the US, US-based? How many from outside the US? Uh, Europe? Asia? OK. so. You have an international presence. What's the difference between what's happening internationally and what's <laughs> happening in the States? Well, every country is different. Uh, so the United States certainly has the highest technology adoption of any other country uh, in the world. But we're working on some very big installations. Latin America, over the past couple of years, has really invested in technology. And some of that comes through political promises. Um, we will sometimes joke that there's really nothing better for technology coming into education than a benevolent dictator. Um, <laughs> the, uh, because when they essentially make a decision, it's centralized and it moves throughout the country. Uh, within the US, we have to work school district by school district, sometimes school by school. Uh, we um, have been working on deployments in Argentina for about the past four years and have now deployed four million systems there. Uh, we worked with Mexico this last year and deployed about 705,000 tablets that are going into their fifth graders. Uh, Bolivia is a, an amazing story for Latin America. They were really lagging a little bit behind some of their neighbors uh, and had put together a deal with, the Venez or with Venezuela as well as Cuba to do some exchanges to bring up their literacy rate. And their president, uh, in running for his third term, uh, made a promise to be able to put computers into the hands of every high school student in Bolivia. And we were there a couple of months ago when they uh, shipped out the first 230,000 systems. That in itself really isn't the significant part. Those 230,000 systems were manufactured in Bolivia. Uh, so they essentially went from nowhere to now making systems for education. We toured a factory that's under construction right now. Uh, we like to think of the systems we designed for education as purpose-built for education. Uh, this is a purpose-built factory for education. Uh, they'll manufacture all of the computers that will go into high school students. That's four million systems over four years. And they'll have software programmers there. They're going to start developing their own education software. Uh, they'll have their support desk there uh, to essentially do remote <laughs> IT for the schools. So really a, an amazing story of essentially going to, I wouldn't say nowhere, but lagging. Uh, four years from now, we will hold them up as a lighthouse example of a country who really got it right. Um, and already they're seeing incredible results. Um, higher retention rates for their students. And we were there again when some of the students received their PCs for the first time. Incredible enthusiasm. Um, as a matter of fact, a little bit re of regret that they were graduating seniors um, and uh, that they didn't have the systems throughout their entire high school period of time. So amazing things really happening around the world. In the academic community of universities, who we call the benevolent dictator, the provost. Yeah. <laughs> um, are most of your games sold in the US? Or The US is about half of our market. Um, but our games don't have any language in them. So we can sell to any child, really, or we can, any child could use them around the world. And we've sold uh, or apps in about 160 countries, some that we've never set our foot in, which is, which is amazing. But we do see that there's some markets that have local cultures. Japan is a huge app market, but we we're, don't have a big presence there. So even though we have a big um, distribution of apps, it, it, there's spots that are still white on the map, sort of. So uh, you're a UC, a CSU, California State University graduate, right? I am. So cheers for the CSU. But you're a UC graduate, right? I'm a UC graduate. So how are you involved in the computer science program with the social conscience that your program has? Yeah, so uh, computer science at UCI was very uh, enlightening. And I, you know, I, I, for me, I, I love computer science because it's all about problem solving. It's, uh, it gives me a perspective on how to look at solving different problems. Um, and you know, looking at the social side of computer science, being there now on the education side, it's somewhere I didn't really imagine to be. Um, but you know, it's, there's a great need for it. There's a great need for programs on uh, young folks to really reach out to their communities 
and help kind of evangelize and spread word of STEM technology and STEM education and careers. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting work. So how do you get the college students and the high school students and the middle school students on the same page? So, yeah, well, we train the college students first. Um, they learn how to be a mentor, uh, which is really key, as we've found through the program. Um, some of these mentors still stay in touch with the students, and they mentor them throughout, you know, the, the past year. Um, I, myself, I actually taught my first year as a teacher um, because, you know, I figured the best way to learn how this program is going to work is to actually teach it and have a team. Um, so after kind of training, mentors make a commitment uh, to go twice a week after school and train these students for a two-hour class. Uh, and really, that's, that's where all the interaction, kind of the magic happens. Uh, and I like to say our mentors really enjoy being around, you know, kids because these are students that they have no kind of limits. And when they think of this idea, you know, they'll, they'll come up with a crazy idea and you can't say no to them because you don't even know if, you know, if it's possible or not. So you just have to say go with it and you kind of follow up with them. Um, so I think it's this culture that has sustained with mentors and, um, and students and you know, students enjoy it because you know, in Orange County, we're a thriving community, but there are a lot of communities around where students don't have access to technology, and those are really the students that we target um, who get these experiences, and it can be life-changing for them. Uh, so what are the years. demographics of your clientele? Uh, three to nine predominantly. We have some uh, digital toys that go higher, but that's our age range there. Okay, and yeah. what about the social economic? Have you done marketing data on that? Uh, no, we don't, but we know they, they have to have an iPhone or <laughs> an iPad or some sort of tablet, so that probably says something. So, yeah. And then where do you get your play designers with the potentially some of the uh, people in, involved in your the app? Uh, your app plus end up being designers for you? Where, where do you see your students going and where do you get your talent? Um, yeah, play designers are really hard to recruit. Um, we, they're all, for us, they're all based out of Stockholm. Um, but they, they can have a, a plethora of background, design, education, technology. Um, just, they just need to have a drive to play and, and, and to create something that is open-ended and that could surprise them and anyone who uses it. So with your work that you just spoke about, are there examples like that in other countries where you maybe didn't start from the ground up? Do you have different flavors of integration of the sort of combination of makers and people using their own devices and people playing and gaming? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the makers really just, I would say, making its way into schools as part of the formal curriculum. And uh, we have a product, uh, Galileo, which essentially is a small board and is relatively inexpensive that uh, we can bring into schools and support their programming curriculum on that. I mean, we've worked with teachers to actually develop some curriculum as well. The uh, BYOD overall is, I would say, still a challenge uh, for schools. The you know multitude of devices coming in certainly in a K through 12 environment where they don't have dedicated IT uh, really just makes it difficult. Um, but uh, we have experience with schools who are doing it. Australia four years ago or five years ago I guess had made a commitment that every high school student would be able to get a PC as an incoming freshman. They would have it for their four years while they were in high school. Uh, but they went through some budget changes this last year, and essentially that budget line item went away which was really a challenge for them because they had already essentially developed their curriculum. Teachers had essentially now standardized around uh, students having a system. And so they have gone to a BYOD model now across the board for their high school students. But it's the only country that I'm aware that has done it on that, that, uh, that scale. But the shift then is to the software. What is the software that the teachers are really going to be able to use that's going to be common across platforms because you have a mix of systems as well as a mix of operating systems. You have Apple devices, Android devices, now Chromebooks going into the schools. So it, BYOD, I'd say, is still, still a bit of a challenge. The previous panel, uh, one of the women made a comment that, you know, it, it's hard when you have a number of applications that are coming in that have to be supported because they're not integrated. And, and that really is the problem with the BYOD model as well. Uh, that the students now can use the devices, but they can't really use it in the same integrated way that we advocate. 
where it can be used really from the beginning of the day, not just through the end of the school day, but really the end of the day, including their homework and all of the assignments that they do on it. So we, we're still, I would say, exploring you know, how we can make BYOD better. Uh, we've had some conversations with Microsoft and Google, of course, you know, they believe that the Chromebook is simple enough that uh, it solves that problem. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so still, I would say it's a very mixed model uh, with no really great solution either from a learning management system point of view or really even how they manage the content on the devices. And, and for you, you, you do primarily Android apps, is that? We do. We found that it's the best and uh, free, but also very user friendly in terms of there's actually a platform that was developed by Google and MIT um, called App Inventor a couple years ago as a research project that really is uh, great at engaging kids uh, with app development. And we've built a whole set of curriculum and uh, mod modules on that. Yeah. And do you proceed turning any of your products into products that create apps? Um, not, not, not right now. We, there could be something with, uh, related to programming, uh, something like that, in the future at some point. Um, but we would love to be able to do that, but it's, it's not in the cards right now. It sounds like, although you were involved in technology and computers and bring your own device, that a lot of this that you have to do is the team building, the bridge, making bridges between the, the university and K-12, you between the governments, the teachers, sure. the manufacturers. <laughs> How does the edu education need glue those together? Does it help you or does it hurt you in trying to move forward in your various projects? Oh, I, I think the focus on education helps us for sure. Uh, everyone cares about education, uh, whether they're directly involved in it uh, or it's simply a social cause or element for them. And so we, well, generally when I tell people that we, uh, we're focused on education and have a vertical team, uh, people are surprised that Intel is focused on education and that we're doing as, as many things as we are. Um, we, have, we, of course, are a microprocessor company. That's, that's our primary function and what we do well. But we, we also believe that the position that we have in the industry almost puts us in a unique position to do the things that we want to do in education because everyone's really willing to partner with us. Uh, we, uh, we work across operating systems. We can work with multiple software vendors even when they compete with each other. I have a great relationship with Microsoft and I have a great relationship with Google. Uh, I have a great relationship with Apple. They, they all compete vigorously. So I uh, understand that happens every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're neutral. Uh, what we want to do is be able to provide the best solution possible. And so you know, when we formed the new vertical, I said that it was really going to be important for us to be able to work with publishers. We hadn't really worked with the publishers in the past. Uh, we didn't have a reason to work with them. They didn't really have a reason to work with us. And so uh, I just did a trial balloon and put a call into Pearson, and they took my call. Uh, we now have relationships with you know, about 95 different publishers around the world where we're working with them on their move to digital. So um, education really is a, I would say, it's a, it's a unifying factor. Uh, everyone cares about it and whether they want to just be involved a little bit or they want to be involved in a big way, we're able to partner with them all. And is your program growing? It is, it is. So uh, we started two years ago with a pilot with just two schools. Uh, we expanded last year to five, and this year we've uh, expanded out to two universities and five schools. Um, and we've been uh, kind of uh, getting support, and we were recognized by the Clinton Foundation uh, earlier in 2014 uh, for a huge STEM growing program. And our goal next year is to partner with four universities and up to 10 schools. Uh, so we're growing, and you know, it, it really is because of the partnerships, as John mentioned. Uh, you know, we've found that we're able to reach students it's, it's harder if, you know, I have to go to a school district, but it's, it's much easier if you can find folks who are, you know, well-versed with the system and kind of partner with them to reach the students, right? So we're, we found ourselves in the last year partnering with the Girls Incorporated organization to reach and engage more women in technology. Uh, we found ourselves with uh, Boys and Girls Clubs. Um, so, you know, I, I really want, it is really growing because of the partnerships, so, yeah. Okay, I wanted to open up for questions. We have one right there in the front. Okay, actually, I w can I ask one question? So, Jens, I, <clears throat> something I wanted to ask you was, um, as you mentioned before, Toka Boca really is an education company. Um, you're more of a play company, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, do 
do you see more of the toy and the that whole industry moving more towards education with the use of, of technology, or do you you know, or is that kind of still separate? It's a, a toy, you know, it's a play. It's not really education. How do you see that changing, if at all? Yeah, I see that a, a little bit, especially with uh, with Minecraft. Uh, teachers know that it's so engaging to a lot of their students, and they bring it in, and it was never meant to be an educational tool. And I'd like to see that a lot more happening because what really, what children learn the most from is what interests them. I, I read a study, the results from it, that said that children understood, it was 30 times more uh, of an explanation to why, how much children understood a text. Um, the explanation could be, or there was a higher correlation between, third times higher correlation between, un, um, if the child was interested in the text, then how complicated the text was to read, right? So if you're really interested in something, which you are, if, if, it's, if it's a toy, right, it's made to really capture you, um, you can learn so much more than if you bring something in that's been sort of forced on you, and yeah, you, you're just not gonna take it in, even if it has all the content that, that you want the child to, uh, to be able to grasp. I see, yeah, so that makes sense. And one other question, so Jens, when you go to toy conferences and you're involved in that, do you see more discussion around STEM or some of the new common core in science, you know, that whole discussion? There's not common core for science, is there, it's STEM. So, you know, is there uh, more discussion around that in the toy industry? Definitely STEM, you start to hear it. Um, there's, it's not huge, but at every every time you go, you hear it. Someone has made a, something that teaches science or math. Or, yeah. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Dr. Nina Kraft. I'm with CharityPartnering.com, and this mess, this question is for John. Um, I'm in one of the hats I wear is we work with nonprofit organizations, and we find that there are all these generous companies that are donating tablets and other technology. And the problem is that the adults who are in charge of working with the students don't have any training. So I'm wondering if you're finding the same thing in the educational space and what you're doing to address that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great question. The, I would say the biggest impediment to um, really scaling technology in education is the teachers and teacher readiness. They, um, there's first of all a fear that the technology is gonna disrupt the class. And then the second fear is that they're not gonna know how to use the technology and that the students potentially are gonna know how to use it better than they will. So we uh, developed some professional development for teachers really now about 10 years ago and we continue to um, advance that. So we've now trained about 11 million teachers around the world on how to use technology within their classrooms. We are starting to work much more closely with Microsoft. Microsoft has a similar program to ours, and we're essentially comparing roadmaps so that they're complementary to each other and that we can essentially advance uh, much faster. But it, it is a big challenge, for sure. And, um, you know, over time, it'll get easier, without question. Uh, but even younger teachers, when they're being trained, if they're not trained how to use technology uh, within their classrooms, they're somewhat reluctant, too, even though they might be more comfortable with the technology. Uh, it's, it started off only as face-to-face, -face. now it is blended. But I think the teacher preparation is a major challenge. That's an area where we are in California, is that oh, yeah. schools of education, um, we only put out 10% of the teachers that shift every year, and so you've got 90% of them that may not have had the training. Right. And most of the schools of ed really do not have a rich set of, of guidelines and models or courses around technology integration. Right. So you're probably doing more teaching these people through yeah. your, your uh, app project where the students are sort of feeding it up, up yeah. the channel. And, and that was, just to add on, that was one of our challenges was, you know, we approached it as how do we go train the teacher so they can train the student. And we soon learned that, you know, it's, it's a lot of time and preparation that was needed uh, for them to really understand it because some of these concepts are fairly new and they're changing every day. Um, and we figured the best way to really do that was to equip the classroom teacher with mentors um, who come in and they kind of take ownership. And we found from that is some of the teachers are really engaged and they're learning more from having the mentors teach 
um, and they're able to you know get better at it every year as well. So I think that's a lot where we could learn a lot from the a play designer because I haven't seen too many people go to a Minecraft professional development workshop. Yeah. Well, and, and if I could just add on to your comment, uh, we've had experiences also in some countries around the world, Panama being the most notable, where to address some of the concerns that the teachers had about technology coming into the classrooms, uh, we identified the students who really were technology savvy. And essentially, they went through a week of training uh, before all the systems arrived at the school. They were given special shirts to wear, uh, so that when other students or even the teachers were having problems, you know, they were the designated person that would come and help resolve the problem. Okay. Uh, other question in the audience? Um, I do want to just plug something, if I might. Uh, okay. Nina and I also work together with the Kay Family Foundation out of California, which offers uh, two scholarships to students who are um, creating apps. It's called the Appreneur Scholar Award. Um, today we have uh, one college student and one high school student. They are over at the LVCC uh, getting their scholarships today. It's $5,000 scholarship each. So I will uh, plug that. It's a wonderful program, but we need your help spreading the word. So you can go to our website, appreneurscholars.com, and I hope you will spread the word about that as we take nominations for next year and kids can uh, enter to win. Thank you. Okay, right, and the question right up here. If you hold on for a second, the mic's coming. Hi, my name is Kush. Um, I'm in finance and uh, you know, probably a little bit distant from a lot of the topics here in some ways, but outside of the school system, in many countries there's a big market for uh, home education or all the education that happens outside of the official school system. And in some countries, the free content that's widely available now on the internet is eroding the traditional paper-based services in a big way. Um, in some cases, that's very good, but in some cases, it's creating a little bit of a chaos. Um, and I'm just curious whether you're addressing that part of the market in any way. When you work with schools, um, is there a factor that the education outside of the school plays to complement what the teachers do uh, while the kids are at school because a lot of the supplementary education happens at, at home as well. And you know, this, again, it's a very local topic, so it differs country by country and also within the same country, different segments would have different aspects in this regard. But, but uh, I'm just curious um, whether you have any insights into that. Uh, so you're right. Uh, there is a lot of focus on education that takes place outside of the classroom. I, I think there might have been two parts to your question. The, in terms of supplemental, it's not a big focus of ours. Um, we do work with the publishers on their overall digital curriculum and content. Uh, we are also now starting to work with some of those free content providers ourselves. Um, but again, curriculum is, is very local. So it's typically based on what the government has um, decided they want to do. We have countries like China, Korea, Singapore, India, where the after-school programs um, are very formalized and the, essentially what happens in the classroom, they know that a lot of the students are going to be going into these after-school programs and so uh, they dovetail very nicely together. And a lot of the after-school programs really are assessment preparation. So we're now starting to work with some of the companies who run those programs to see if there's some ways that we can help them move more fully to digital because they're actually not very digital in some cases today. Um, in Africa, we, there's a number of countries where uh, the, the belief is that what the students are getting throughout the day really is not sufficient. And so we're really starting to see the rise of more programs that are taking place after school there as well. So I, I think it's an area that is continuing to emerge. It is very local. It's very country-centric. Um, and the publishers uh, are starting to pay a little bit more attention to it, I think, than they were before. It is an interesting area. We have one question, then we'll be the last one. You could grab that one over there. Hi, I'm Sumita Ghosh. My question is for you, John. Um, at Intel, you mentioned you started the vertical education. How big is the team, if you can talk about it a little bit? And what is your focus? And how do you, like, what is your revenue model? Or is it a more nonprofit? Um, 
well, it's funny, I was having a conversation with someone a couple of weeks ago and described to them what we're doing, and the response to me was, you're essentially a nonprofit making a profit, uh, which I think is a great way to think of what we're doing. Uh, my team is about uh, 250 people full-time around the world. Uh, I have a team in Shanghai, a team in California, a team in Ireland, and a team in Romania, and then I have uh, people spread around the world who are doing business development work. We uh, do hardware designs, we do software integration, we also now develop software since the acquisition that we did last year. Uh, I have 15 people who just focus on the user experience within the classroom and uh, spend a lot of time in classrooms. We also have our own business development managers that work with the broader Intel sales force. I have a dedicated marketing team and uh, I have my own technical resources who will typically go in and do consulting early on or if a school is having problems, they'll go in and consult afterwards. I don't get paid for any of the consulting work that we do. Uh, the way that we get paid is the, there's ideally a hardware platform that goes out with an Intel processor in it and uh, we are now starting to charge for some of the software uh, that we deliver on the systems. Uh, before, we essentially wrap that into the system cost now we're breaking it out as a, essentially a separate line item. And uh, we'll beginning, we're beginning to sell software as a service uh, around the content and around the ana analytics. So, you know, today I'm essentially a small division within a large company. 100% uh, of our effort is on education, most of that on K through 12. But we focus on uh, higher ed and we are starting to do some work in supplemental right now as well. Okay. Thank you. We've reached end of our time, but you have a slightly longer break, and so if you want to catch any of the panels, I'm sure you can catch them before the microphones get off. I want to thank all three of you. A very interesting perspective, different views and different things between bringing your own device, tablets, and gaming, and I'm sure we're going to hear from all three of your projects in the future. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, we'll take a break.